All right, so this is an introduction <clears throat> to Islam. Islam is the youngest of the world's great religions, about 1,500 years old. It is also one of the largest, with approximately 1.6 billion. That's a Pew Research number from 2011. Um, the, the second largest religion after Christianity. Uh, it is a very diverse group. This is a universal religion, not an ethnic religion, like Christianity or Buddhism. It appeals to everyone, includes all races, all nationalities. It is the dominant religion in many developing nations in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. That makes it very important. Uh, the dominant belief is that there is only one God, Allah. Allah, Al, is an uh, Arabic article, and La is God. Uh, so Allah means God in Arabic, with a big G. It's the God of the Jews and the Christians. It's Yahweh. We all three worship the same God. Though Allah has made himself known through other prophets and other times, his best and final revelation, according to uh, Muslim tradition, is, w w was to the, uh, the prophet Muhammad in the 7th century uh, CE. Some clarification. Islam means submission. It can also mean peace. Um, it, cognate of salam, which means peace. Um, a Muslim is, although, or is one who submits to God. So where are the Muslims? Let's look at the top, uh, in terms of raw, raw numbers, the top uh, Muslim populations in top eight countries. Number one may surprise you, Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is a huge country. Um, it's, the, I believe, the fourth largest population in the world after China, India, the U.S. Um, that 205 million Muslims is about 88% of uh, of Indonesia's uh, population. Number two is Pakistan, the land of the pure. Uh, when uh, British India was uh, divided in 1949, uh, it was divided into Muslim and uh, Islamic parts. Pakistan, uh, th this uh, 178 million is the, the vast majority of Pakistan's population. It is, it is mostly, um, almost exclusively Muslim. Number three is India, with uh, 177 million. Notice that's only one, one million less than Pakistan. Until recently, India was the second largest Muslim nation. Um, however, that 177 million um, is only about 14, 15% of India's population. Uh, but there, there are just as many uh, Muslims in India as there are in Pakistan. Number four is Bangladesh, which uh, <clears throat> used to be East Pakistan. At partition, Pakistan was these two non-contiguous pieces, but now Bangladesh is independent. Uh, very different ethnically, linguistically from uh, the Pakistanis, uh, but they are Muslim. Um, and that is the vast majority of, of their population, this 149 million Muslims. Um, uh, I say vast, they, it's probably about 90%. Um, uh, but um, what's interesting about, about Bangladesh is it, 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 it's poor, has a difficult time, because it's about the size of Alabama, but Alabama has 4 million residents. Notice that uh, they have about 160 million. Number five is Egypt. Now notice something interesting. You know, people ignorant of Islam would tend to sort of equate it with, you know, Arabs, uh, this is the first Arabic country I've listed. Uh, it is also the most populous Arab Arabic country. <clears throat> so 80 million Muslims in Egypt, uh, that's about 90% of the population. Remember that 10% of Egypt's population are, are Christian, Coptic Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christians. Number six is Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria <clears throat> is the most populous country in Africa. Uh, this 76 million Muslims are about 48% of Nigeria's uh, population. About another 48% are Christian, uh, kind of half and half. And they, they, it's a sectarian division, unfortunately. Uh, the Christians tend to live in the south, the Muslims in the north. Uh, the Christians tend to be socioeconomically at, at higher levels, uh, and it's a source of conflict. Number seven, uh, Iran with 70, 75 uh, million Muslims, and that's the vast majority of Iran's population. Uh, Iran is also largely, uh, almost exclusively, Shia. 
uh, Muslim. This is the largest uh, concentration of Shia Muslims uh, in the world. We'll talk about uh, uh, that division later. Uh, also, Iran, not an Arab country. They are, they are an Indo-European uh, ethnicity and language. Uh, so uh, still, Egypt is our only Arabic country on the list so far. Finally, Turkey, with about 75 million Muslims. Um, uh, again, not, not Arab. They're Turks. They speak Turkish. Uh, and um, uh, very modern, uh, successful economy, uh, a democracy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so our, our top eight countries, uh, only one is, uh, is Arabic. So uh, only 20% of Muslims, it turns out, are Arab. Uh, uh, Muhammad was Arab, was an Arab, and spoke Arabic, and so Arabic is the liturgical language of uh, the Quran is in Arabic, very beautiful Arabic, uh, and so uh, Ar Arabic is the liturgical language of Islam, much more strictly than even is Latin uh, for uh, Catholics and Greek for Orthodox and uh, Hebrew for Jews. Um, Services uh, are in uh, Arabic, um, and the Quran, only in the 20th century, was the Quran translated into vernacular languages. Um, according to Arab tradition, uh, Abraham is the father of the Arab race through his son Ishmael by his concubine Hagar. They're known as Ibrahim and Ismail in Arabic. Uh, both Jews and Arabs are Semitic peoples with Semitic languages. Their languages are very similar. Uh, the name Barak, for example, is an Arabic uh, Islamic name, which means one who is blessed. The Jewish name Baruch means the exact same thing. Shalom, peace, uses a greeting in um, uh, Hebrew is Salam in Arabic. Uh, very, very similar. Um, Islam emerged in the Arabian Peninsula, in the city of Mecca principally, in the 7th century, 600s CE. Uh, the peninsula has, has some fertile land on the coast and some really good agricultural land and certain oases, but mostly it's vast stretches of barren rock and sand like you would, like you would picture. It is therefore a fairly hostile environment. There were well-established cities uh, like Mecca, but most Arabians um, in the 7th century were nomads, Bedouins. Uh, you've heard that word before, it just means Arab nomads. Um, for, for both the city and the nomadic um, Arabs, the tribe and the clan, clan is sort of a subgrouping within the tribe, were the social organizational scheme. The tribal loyalty superseded any other loyalty, geographic or religious. Uh, this environment was hostile, and an isolated individual or even an isolated family stood little chance of survival. That's what made the tribe so super important. Now, economically, um, this was you know seventh century Arabia, but but there was there was a lot of a lot going on economically. There was some interdependence between the desert tribes and the city tribes. The Bedouins were largely independent, but would trade their the products from their sheep, goat, camels, meat, you know dairy products, wool, uh, to the people of the oases for the agricultural produce from their fields and trees. There were craftsmen who would use the wool to make uh, cloth, uh, complicated garments and tapestries. Then there were people like the Meccans, um, who produced little but made a business of buying and selling and providing markets. Um, they became, in effect, financiers. Uh, also, they were organizers of car caravans. Mecca uh, was, was the nexus of, of many important trade routes. Um, <clears throat> Mecca was famous for a meteoric stone that had fallen there centuries before. The stone became an object <clears throat> of veneration to the Arabs. By the time of Muhammad, pilgrims had built an enclosure around it called the Kaaba. This is the Kaaba, this black uh, cloth encased building you see here on the left. Um, the Kaaba gradually filled with other relics, images, um, paintings, carvings. Uh, one report claims it even contained images of Jesus and Mary, um, orthodox Christian icons. Um, Islamic legend says that the black stone, the meteor, fell from the heavens in the time of Adam and Eve, and that Adam built the Kaaba. 
Another legend says that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba together or rebuilt it. Um, There's several versions, but it's ancient and important. In a period of several months, uh, it, it was sacred. Uh, by the time of Muhammad, even before him. And, and so for a period of several months each year, it was set aside as a time of truce between the warring tribes so pilgrims could travel to Mecca to worship at this shrine. By the time of Muhammad, keepers of the Kaaba were members of the rich and powerful Quraysh uh, tribe. And they derived considerable status from their stewardship of this sacred precinct, also considerable economic advantages. Uh, Quraysh, Qureshi, there's other spellings, uh, Muhammad was born into the Quraysh, but he was from a very minor, relatively poor uh, branch. So what was the, um, the, the pre-Islamic religious scene in Arabia? Well, it was not a complete religious vacuum in the 7th century by any means, although the circumstances certainly were in need of spiritual renewal. It was, you know, it was, the peninsula was locked in a cycle of tribal vengeance. And Growing wealth was creating stratification uh, and, and injustice in society. So Arabia uh, was bordered by two world superpowers to the north, the Byzantine Empire, of course headquartered in Constantinople, and that was Orthodox Christian, and the Persian Sassanid Empire. Uh, this is pre-Islamic, one of the pre-Islamic Persian uh, empires, and so it meant that um, they were uh, Zoroastrian. It's important uh, at, at, at one point, major world religion, monotheistic world religion, that you know had some influence on Christianity. So uh, there were strong Christian and Zoroastrian influences in Arabia. Arabs were also very familiar with Judaism. Uh, many of the desert tribes were, in fact, Jewish. Um, but perhaps the biggest religious influence was the indigenous religion of the area. We don't know much about it. What we know is mostly from the Quran, which you know is disparaging. But it was polytheistic, but with one supreme God who was sort of distant and unapproachable by human beings, Allah, little a, separate word, little l, um, sort of the clockmaker God that with whom humans didn't really make sacrifices or try to build a relationship. The moon was an object of adoration, but most important gods and spirits were local and tribal. Images of these gods were carved and cherished, and blood sacrifices were made to them to uh, propitiate the gods or to preserve the status quo. Perhaps the most important feature of pre-Islamic Arabian religion was animism. Animism, we've discussed this before, but animism is the attribution of a soul to plants, inanimate objects, um, uh, geographic features. Um, and um, spirits were found in stones, trees, wells, um, the, the meteorite in the Kaaba is an example of this. Pre-Islamic tribal religion had no, however, cosmology, mythical, complex mythical explanation for why the world was the way it was, had no strong moral teaching, had no sense of communal responsibility. The only sense of communal responsibility in Arabia was through your tribe. Uh, and if you weren't part of the tribe, there was no responsibility whatsoever. And there were no ideas about the afterlife. It was into this world uh, that, that Muhammad came. And his role was really as improbable as the slave Moses or the carpenter Jesus. He was an illiterate, orphaned caravan manager in a land toward by tribal conflict. But he would change everything. 